welcome to this video on practical histology in which we will have a brief introduction to H&E staining and then take a look at the basic structure and nomenclature of various types of epithelial tissues. So let's get started. On looking into the eyepiece of a microscope, the view looks quite confusing with various patterns of pink and violet, but it becomes slightly easier when we know what these colors are and what's the use of having them on the slide. So let's take a look. The slides which we usually find in the lab are H and E stained. The H stands for hematoxylin, while the E stands for eosin. These are actually the two dyes that color a histological section differentially. Hematoxylin is a basic dye which stains the anionic components of the cells, such as the nuclei, the rRNA and the cartilage matrix. These structures are hence basophilic. On the other hand, eosin is an acidic dye that stains the cationic components such as the cytoplasmic filaments, the intracytoplasmic membrane structures and extracellular fibers. These are thus eosinophilic structures. But what's the use of coloring these structures with these dyes? The reason is that the blue hematoxylin selectively enhances the nuclear details which can then be contrasted against a pink cytoplasmic background that is stained by eosin. Thus we can actually not only distinguish cells from one another but even their intracellular components. Now that we have understood the use of H&E staining, let's move on to learning a bit about the epithelial tissue. The epithelial tissue is avascular and forms the surface lining of the external body surfaces, the internal closed cavities, the body tubes, and the secretory portion of glands. So let us look at the special characteristics of epithelial cells. Firstly, the epithelial cells are connected by tight cell junctions, as you can see in the diagram. Secondly, the epithelial cells exhibit a distinct polarity. This occurs both in terms of the arrangement of the intracellular structures as well as the different surfaces of the cell, namely the apical surface, the lateral surface, and the basal surface. Finally, the epithelial tissue rests on an underlying basement membrane, which is a non-cellular protein polysaccharide rich layer and which is mostly composed of type 4 collagen. Now as the epithelial tissue forms a selective barrier between the external environment and the rest of the tissue, it is always adjacent to some free space. This slide shows the free space adjacent to the layer of the epithelial tissue, visible as a darkly stained layer on the edge of the tissue. Now that is the layer of the epithelial tissue. While we can again see a little bit of free space here, the actual free space to look out for in this slide is the central lumen, which is surrounded by the epithelial tissue. However, the layer on the exterior edge of the tissue is also a special type of epithelial tissue known as the mesothelium. But what if there is no free space around cells which show all the typical characteristics of epithelial tissue? Well, in such a case, certain cell aggregates without a free surface are known as epithelioid tissues. This tissue is common to endocrine glands and in certain types of injuries and infections. The common sites of occurrence of epithelioid tissues or epithelioid cells are leydig cells of the testis, lutein cells of ovary, islets of Langerhans in the pancreas, adrenal gland parenchyma, and the anterior lobe of pituitary gland. Now let us take a brief look at how the epithelial tissue is classified. Just like a person usually has a first name and a surname, the epithelial tissues are similarly identified by a combination of two names. 
The second part or the surname of an epithelium denotes the shape of the cells in that tissue. The shape may be squamous in which the cells are flattened with a centrally bulging nucleus. In fact, the cell may be compared to a fried egg in which the nucleus appears uh, like the bulging yolk. The shape may be cuboidal in which the height of the cell is almost equal to its width. The nucleus is spherical and centrally placed and appears round in the histological section. Finally, the shape may be columnar, consisting of cells which resemble columns having much more height than width. The nucleus in these cells is oblong or ovoid in shape and is usually located in the lower third of the cell towards the basal surface. The first part of the epithelial name denotes the number of cell layers present in that particular epithelium. A single layer of epithelial cells is known as a simple epithelium and may be simple squamous, simple cuboidal or simple columnar epithelium. Two or more layers of epithelial cells when present in a tissue is known as stratified epithelium. The stratified epithelium may again be either stratified squamous, stratified cuboidal, or stratified columnar. However, all the cell layers in a particular stratified epithelium may not be of the same shape. Then how do we determine the type of epithelium in such a case? It is important to note that the shape of the cells of the outermost layer determines the type of stratified epithelium. Before moving further, it is important to understand that in a normal HNE stained section, it may not always be possible to identify the shape of a single cell by its outline. More often than not, the cell membranes are usually not well appreciated, and thus it is the appearance of the nuclei which help us to identify not just the shape of the constituent cells, but also the number of cell layers present in a particular tissue. The next type of epithelium is known as pseudo-stratified epithelium in which there is actually only a single layer of cells, all of which are in contact with the basement membrane but have variable heights, thereby giving an impression of being in multiple layers. Obviously, this type of epithelium can only consist of columnar cells as cuboidal cells have equal height and width. Finally, a special type of epithelial tissue known as transitional epithelium is again composed of multiple cell layers. Although the outermost layer is composed of cuboidal cells, but due to their curved apical surface, they appear as dome-shaped or umbrella-shaped. The transitional epithelium has a special ability to change the number of constituent layers according to the distension and relaxation of the tissue. It is thus commonly found in the lower urinary tract. Now that we have seen how epithelial tissues are classified by a combination of two names, sometimes a middle or a third name is also added in some special cases. This additional name denotes the various apical surface projections that the epithelial cells may exhibit. The cells may be striated or may be with a brush border both of which are varieties of microvilli. The cells may be ciliated or may possess stereocilia. Lastly, some epithelial tissues may be identified by the presence or absence of keratin on the surface and are hence termed as keratinized or non-keratinized. So we can see that the nomenclature of epithelial tissues is actually a structural one rather than a functional. We now come to the end of this video with some examples of the common sites of occurrence of various types of epithelial tissues in the body. In the following videos, we shall look at a methodical approach to identify various types of epithelial tissues.